My name is Genevieve Bell. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, and I'm very excited to welcome you all here to our ANU Reconciliation Lecture for 2024. I want to begin by doing a couple of things. I want to talk about the fact that we've had this lecture in place since 2018. This has been part of a journey that the ANU has been on to think about how is it that we bring different voices to this stage, different kinds of conversations and unfold different ways of thinking about what reconciliation might look like. We've had some extraordinary speakers since 2018 and today's will be no exception. I want to acknowledge where we are today in Cambry in a precinct the name of which was gifted to us by the traditional owners and elders of this place after a series of long conversations about our intentions, about who we were and about why we wanted this to be a place where people would gather. So you get to be in Cambry, a name that we get to proudly hold about this place and about the intention of how we would occupy it. I'm always struck by the fact that we get to be in places that carry those names, having spent a long time living in the United States. I was 30 years in the US and I think about all the names of the places that were never called that I lived and all the nations who weren't acknowledged in every event I attended from New York to San Francisco and all the places in between. And there's something quite remarkable about getting to be in a place where we get to call its name and think about the through line from now back to all the previous moments that occupied this place. Which means that it is also my distinct pleasure to welcome Selena Walker to the ANU and to this moment. Selena is a Ngunnawal woman. She's a proud Ngunnawal woman. She is the granddaughter of Annie Agnes O'Shea. She is an award winner. She has made her way all the way from Woden to get here. And those of you who are from Canberra understand that coming from Woden is about like coming from space uh, and that getting here in one piece is always an adventure. And I'm reminded of this as a Canberra child myself. I left Canberra, Selena, for 30 years and I ran into someone in a grocery store recently and they said, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Did you move to Tuggeranong? I'm like San Francisco and they kind of went, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, same, same, <laughs> exactly. So will you join me in welcoming Selena Walker to the stage? Thank you. Yuma, Kalaganya Jelena Walker, Darawanuna Darawanuna Wall. Hello, my name is Selena Walker and this is Ngunnawal Country. I want to first start by acknowledging my elders, the Ngunnawal elders, and pay respect to my elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge my little cousin, Janessa, another Ngunnawal and Wiradjuri princess that's with us today. I want to acknowledge the recent passing of my grandmother, Ani Agnes Shea, who was the most senior Ngunnawal elder here. She was a little old black woman, but she did get around, so I'm sure many of you crossed paths. If you did, you're one of the lucky ones. I'd also like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us here this afternoon. Welcome my brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles. I'd like to acknowledge your traditional lands and extend that to all of our non-Indigenous friends that have joined us. Ladies, gentlemen and distinguished guests, welcome. So the Nunna, I'll give, you, I'll give a, an official welcome to country first. Um, as a traditional owner, I'm allowed to do that. And then I'll just have a yarn with you. So the Ngunnawal community are the traditional custodians of Canberra and the region. You may not be aware that the Ngunnawal nation is made up of several family groups and not just individuals who represent this country. Therefore, as a community, we have an elected body known as the United Ngunnawal Elders Council to represent us, along with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elected body of the ACT. This is important for you to understand and acknowledge, for our identity is a collective identity. There are other Indigenous and non-Indigenous people from around the nation, the country and the world who've come to live on Ngunnawal land. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome you all. The tradition of welcoming the people to country is a practice that was handed down by our ancestors, old people and elders from the beginning of time. Before entering another person's country, you would first announce your arrival and not enter until the traditional owner formally welcomed you. The reason for this practice was to protect your spirit whilst in another person's country and also to show respect for the country which you're entering. It's wonderful to see this practice is now recognised and respected. I suppose it's not like entering into someone's home unless you're first invited. The Ngunnawal people, as within all Aboriginal people, have a great heritage that we would like to share with all Australians from every walk of life. As you are aware, Canberra means meeting place. And Canberra has been a place of gathering for many Aboriginal tribes of Australia to come together to deal with important business and also for ceremonial purposes. Our Ngunnawal ancestors believe in the importance of people gathering to build relationships, share knowledge and to celebrate the gift of heritage and history. We believe it's important for all to recognise our unique history and again understanding that our land is our heritage and how loss of the lands has disconnected so many Aboriginal people from their spiritual links, cultural heritage and identity. Reconciliation is not just a word, it's an action, and it's a human rights movement. 
As an Aboriginal person in this country, I've only been counted as a human being for 57 years. Let me repeat that while well, that sinks in. I, as a beautiful black woman in Australia, have only been counted as a human being for 57 years. I'm only 43. We are very young in our reconciliation journey here in Australia, but we're on the right path. By incorporating proper cultural protocols, like welcome to country, acknowledgement of country, smoking ceremonies, etc., we are on the road to true reconciliation. It does hurt me though that my dad was born a tree, that my grandmother was a mother in this country before she was a human being. So I ask you all to take a moment and think about how old you are, how old your children are, and how old your elders are, and what you're doing to contribute to that reconciliation human rights movement. The referendum and vote that happened last year was another huge milestone in our reconciliation journey. Not the result that we wanted, but it did bring a lot of truth telling. Helped us to identify where we have to focus our efforts and what states need the most amount of help. I'm so proud to be a Canberra and I'm proud of my fellow Canberrans for the yes vote here in the ACT. Still a lot of work to be done, but it's a demonstration that the work that my grandmother and many other elders have done towards reconciliation can influence that change that we all want. Remembering that that vote was not a vote for me to be Aboriginal, it was not a vote for me to be a traditional owner, it was a vote to edit a document, and that's what Australia said no to. So we'll recalibrate, we'll reassess, and we'll find another way forward that works for all Australians to continue to fight for First Nations justice. It's funny, every time I, I say the word referendum or vote, I see people get fidgety and uncomfortable. We've got to stop this. It is a shared history, so there has to be shared accountability. If we continue to live in shame here in Australia, we are never going to progress forward. I don't want my boys and my little cousins to be standing up here in 20, 30 years' time fighting and advocating for the same things that I am today that my grandmother has done for the last 60 years and my ancestors for the last 200 years. That change happens with us. So I encourage you all to continue to have those conversations, have those awkward discussions where learning and understanding, which is what true reconciliation actually is, lies. It lies in a simple yarn. So on behalf of the Ngunnawal people, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to country. Yumalandi Yunanga Yerebu Yungu, which means you may leave footprints on our land now, or in other words, welcome to country. Um, that is an official welcome to country. And so I was asked today to come here and to, to speak to you to try and incite some, some of my wisdom. Um, and I still don't even know what I'm gonna talk about, like, and I'm standing up here. Uh, that is because I connect with my ancestors and I am usually guided by them as to what has to be said. There is three things that I want you to leave today that I'm going to give to you, which is the Macca's drive through the uh, hexagon theory, and um, the amputated limb. I'll explain those a little bit later. Um, but first, a little bit about me. <clears throat> so for those that don't know, I am a current kinship carer. So I have no biological children of my own, but I do have kin care of eight of my little cousins. Yes, I said eight, hence the grey hair. Um, but, you know, it's, it's actually just part of our culture that that's, that's actually what we do. So we do if we can, we will take them on. Um, I have worked in the community sector for kind of over 15 years. Um, prior to that, I was in um, childcare and retail. I never got my HSC because I quit 10 weeks before in year 10, 10 weeks before the HSC because... I didn't feel like they could teach me anything more and I didn't need a certificate to tell me that I was smart. Um, followed my dad in that regard. Um, and yeah, started working a week later um, at Big W in Woden. Um, so yeah, as I said, you know, I have, I have been thinking about what, what it is that I could talk to you about. And for me, it's, it's, it's always about reconciliation. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the ACT Reconciliation Council um, and have been on the council for, um, gosh, eight years now. So it started in 2018 
and following my grandmother's work. She was a huge advocate for our mob, but in particular our kids, which is exactly what I do. So I do a lot of work in the education space. I didn't have the greatest experiences um, in education. Uh, in primary school, there was only two kids that I identified, which was me and my brother. And in the high school, I, I got bullied and, you know, lost the self-esteem and the self-confidence and all of that that comes with it. But there was, there was one white woman that, you know, she tried really hard to incorporate the culture but got too much pushback. Um, that was my first experience of my own culture. It was in Year 7 by a white person and all we did was, was clap sticks, just bang clap sticks. That was my first exposure to it. And so when I was an adult, I didn't want that for any other kid to be able to go through that experience because my grandmother has always instilled in me that education is the pathway. Um, and as an Aboriginal person, yep, you have to work twice as hard because we have to prove ourselves and demonstrate to the white people. But doesn't mean that it's not, not achievable. So I did a lot of work in the, in the education space um, trying to trying to shift that mindset of our teachers. When I was in primary school, I wanted to become a teacher. And then I realised it's like six years of education after year 10. And I was like, no, stuff that, I'm not doing that. Um, but now I find myself as a teacher anyway. So I am somewhat fulfilling my dreams. The, um, the other part to kind of my... You know, it's reconciliation and it's children and our young people. So they are the future. And, you know, I wouldn't be standing up here if my ancestors and elders, you know, just accepted a no and didn't continue to fight and challenge the status quo. I stand on the shoulders of giants and I want to honour those giants. And seeing how my grandmother worked was just profound to me. Um... If anyone's ever met her, like she did it with such a grain of salt. She was she was so kind and she would constantly say, I don't know why they want me to go on this board. Like uh, she had a mission education, as she called it, um, and she didn't think that she could impart any wisdom. I still today somewhat feel like that where I'm like, why do they want to talk to me? But we speak from the truth and talk from our heart. And, you know, that's the biggest lesson that I learned was – you know, my nan used to always say, if you give respect, you get respect. And even if you get disrespect, you still give respect back because that's how you break the cycle. So I learned a lot in terms of that. Um, anybody who's watched her documentary will know that, you know, she was kind of pushed into this. And um, so was I, never considered myself a leader, didn't hated public speaking. Um, I figured out in high school though, if you if you go first, like and do an oral presentation first straight after recess, no one's listening because they're too busy coming down from the high of being outside. And so I managed to get through that way. Now I'm a little bit different where I'll actually stop and if you're on your phone or you're talking to me uh, or you're talking, I'll actually just wait for you to, to pay attention. But you know, it's part of becoming older and an adult and being that leader. Um, so now I do the same where I, you know, I will acknowledge the young people in the room because we are important and everybody is important and it's important to acknowledge that. And so, you know, I don't get nervous or anything anymore because my nan, God love her, you know, she, she forced me into it and she would even lie to me sometimes and go, oh, I can't do this welcome or I can't do this, can you go and do it because there's no one else? And I'd be like, oh, okay. But she knew, you know, she knew she had to push and push and push. And, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful now that she pushed me. Um, not because of the, like, I actually I hate people running through, like, the honour roll and all the awards and stuff because, like, I actually get embarrassed and shame about it. Like, even though I've got it, I'm, like, I'm, I'm grateful for it, the acknowledgement, but it's, it's not about that for me. And, you know, that's because, not because I don't want people to see me differently, but... You know, I'm still Jenny from the block kind of thing. Like, I'm still just sell, you know, and you can always be approachable. Sometimes when we, we, we lift ourselves up higher, 
it can seem out of reach and I don't ever want any child to feel that way. And part of what I do is to break down those stereotypes. So our kids at the moment are, you know, they're driven by social media and they're consumed by society's expectations and whatnot. So when I go and do welcomes now, you know, I wear TNs because kids wear TNs. And, you know, I don't dress up deliberately now because are you here to judge my outfit or are you here to listen to my words? And we've got to shift that mentality by doing something quite, quite bold like that. You know, and my nan did that in such a, such a generous way, you know, that that's what influenced that change. So I do this to break down those stereotypes. Um, if, like, I actually don't like talking to people. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm always off with the kids. Like, I'll go and, and hang out with the kids rather than hang out with the adults and talk. Um, I'm a big kid myself, anyone who knows me. Like, the, my first ever handbag that I owned was a Mickey Mouse one, which was last year, Peoples, because I'm a big kid. Um, but these are the things that make us human, right? As blackfellas, we are very relational. And so it is that connection. And it's not, it's not about being fake or trying to be someone else or trying to be someone that you think that they are. It's not easy. It takes a lot of courage. But that's where the change comes from. Now, everybody that's here is here for a reason. You just want to influence change or you just want to increase your knowledge. And, you know, again, that just comes from, from talking and listening. And I've had to kind of, you know, my nan would talk to anybody and she'd bow you up for ages as well um, just to have a yarn. Um, and so I've, I've had to kind of push past that own, you know, anxiety to go, okay, I've got, to, I've got to talk to people. And especially in this day and age where we communicate primarily through text, which can be misinterpreted so easily, you know, we've, we, we've got to continue to have those conversations. And, you know, my nan hated technology, um, but she came from a different era. And so I now use technology because that's, that's the key to our kids. That's the key to communication for them, as well as music. As much as I hate the rap music, you know, I still listen to it. As much as I hate WWE, like, I watch it because that's the connection with the kids. And as adults, we forget this. We forget that we have to get down to their level rather than expecting them to come up to us because that's how you elevate their voice. That's how you empower them. Um, so as I said earlier, there are, there are three things that I, I wanted to, to talk about and give to you, right? The best way to kind of influence change, um, you know, for us, Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC Week is every week for us. It's every day. Every day I'm constantly teaching and retraining people around reconciliation and cultural protocols and respect. And I'm equally being proud about my culture and, you know, wearing my heart on my sleeve and embracing who I am. That is every day for us and as it should be for you. So whilst we do have Reconciliation Week and NADOC Week, we need to get out of that box, out of that week and do it all year round because then it doesn't become that token. It becomes genuine. So there are three things that I wanted to, to talk about. So the Macca's drive through the hexagon theory, and the amputated limb. So these are three things that I've come up with myself to try and help non-Indigenous people to understand us, understand what we need, and kind of help us. We're the longest living culture. We don't need saving. So the first thing is stop trying to save us. We know what we're doing, right? You had your first lesson today with me being late, okay? We run on Koori time. It's called Koori time where we are constantly late. Especially if you're Selena Walker, you're at least 15 to 30 minutes late, right? I work off a different clock. I don't know what that clock is, but this is my excuse for it, right? We don't need saving. What we need help with is to navigate the white man's world because that's what we don't understand, right? So the hexagon, 
right? I actually, I loved COVID. I thought, I thought COVID actually brought a lot of good things. It was a challenge, but it pushed so many people out of their comfort zones, right? So Aboriginal people are a square peg, right? White man's world is a round hole. We are never going to fit together, right? As much as we try, it's never going to work. COVID made us all conform to a triangle. Whether we wanted to or not, you had to conform to a triangle, no matter who you were, to be able to progress forward, right? Now, post-COVID, we all need to be working towards a hexagon because a circle fits within a hexagon. A triangle fits within a hexagon and the square fits within a hexagon. We need to find something that's going to work for all of us, right? Everyone been to a McDonald's drive through here? If you're shaking your head, you're a liar because everybody has been to a McDonald's drive through right? <laughs> well done. You're like my dad. He's never been either. Um, so when you go to a McDonald's drive through you're presented with two lanes, yes? Neither one of them is right or wrong. They're just different, but not less. Moving forward, I want you to think of so at the end of the, the Macca's drive through lane, no matter which one you choose, you still get the same outcome, yeah? Still get your Big Mac, still get your coffee, still get your hash brown, whatever it may be. Just two different ways to get there. Moving forward, I want you to think of one of those McDonald's drive through lanes as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander way of doing things and the other one as the non-Indigenous way. Still the same outcome, just a different lane to get there. What we are doing... Now, the work that, that me and Cameron and everybody who works in the sector, every sector, towards reconciliation and towards better outcomes, is with, we are constructing that third lane, right, which is both. It's just one lane for both, right? When you are looking at policies or judging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Think about that McDonald's drive through and be critical of yourself. Are you trying to force them to come into your lane or do you maybe need to jump into that other Macca's lane? Because it's still the same outcome, it's just a different way to get there. It's like coming to the city. How many different ways are there to drive to get here? There's no one right way. There's no wrong way. Just different ways of doing things. So be critical of yourself. Do you need to jump lanes or are you trying to force them into your lane? Because we have a certain way of working. We have cultural protocols that we must follow, which can prevent us from doing certain things white man's way. This needs to be at the forefront of everybody's minds because when we say no, we don't just say no because we don't want to. It's just sometimes there could be a very good reason. Men's and women's business is a great example of this. So I don't know how much you know about men's and women's business, but it's sacred. And, you know, I often offend people by talking about men's and women's business because we live in a transgender world and, you know, they ask, well, where is the transgender kind of business? And unfortunately, this is a 65,000-year-old protocol and cultural law. I don't have the authority to change that. So I'm going to continue to talk about men's and women's business because that's what we've done for 65,000 years. So it's not an intentional disrespect, it's just our cultural law. The other thing that I get asked all the time that I, you know, people have been asking me, you know, you know what, why is connection to country so important? What, what is this dream time like? It's, you know, scary and why do you talk to ghosts and all this kind of stuff, right? So there are some things that we don't do. So we don't whistle at night because it brings the Burex. Burex is the, the, the Aboriginal word for ghosts, right? And, you know, the, the only way that I can describe it that can, you can empathise with is the amputated limb, right? So looking around, I can't see anybody with an amputated limb, right? But we all know if you get a leg cut off, you still, like, you can't see it, it's not there, you can't touch it, the leg is no, is no longer there, but you still get an itchy big toe, yeah? You still get that arthritis knee from playing netball when you were younger, 
thinking you're a big woman, right? No one, we've all got legs. We don't know this for sure, but we know it because it's connected to the spine, to the nerves that's connected to the brain, right? You can't see it or touch it, but yet you can actually feel it, right? This is what our connection to our, our dream time is like. It's an amputated limb. Every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person has a, a, an amputated limb that you cannot see, that you cannot touch. But it is there. It is our connection to our ancestors. It is our connection to the dream time. It's the connection to the country. What we need to do as the adults, for every single Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, is to support and nurture that amputated limb. I know things about my culture that nobody have, has ever told me. That comes from my ancestors. This is how knowledge has been passed down. This is why we still feel the pain of colonisation, why we feel the torture of the massacres. It's through that amputated limb. And, you know, why we still endure the hurt from the stolen generation. So when we're talking to care and protection or docs or whatever it may be called, they mistake our anger for actual, it's passion and it's being channeled because we are still channeling that hurt. When we get things right and we heal, we don't just heal it for ourselves, we heal it for our ancestors. There's a lot of healing to be done, a lot. But it's through that amputated limb that this work is actually happening, which is why it's so important for us to continue to practice our culture and why it's important for us to continue to support and nurture that amputated limb, particularly for our kids. Our kids, and, you know, I do a lot in the care and protection space. Here in the ACT, we have over 800 kids in care over 33% of them are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. That leads to so much identity, you know, loss. They're the kids that we really need to be focusing on. But all kids, you know, we live in complex worlds. Every family is complex. We don't know what they've been through or what they need to go through to heal. But how do we learn that? We learn it through our cultural practices like smoking ceremonies. We learn it through um, healing practices. And this is why it is so important for our schools um, and the adults working with our kids to actually first understand and acknowledge it, but to also support it. So if you don't do an acknowledgement to country, that hurts that kid through that amputated limb. They don't, know why it, they don't know why it's hurting, but they know that something's not right because our spirit feels it. If you don't fly the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, that hurts our spirit. Again, they don't know why it's hurting, but it's through that amputated limb that their ancestors, our ancestors are telling us something's not right and we've got to fix it. The other, the other part for me as to, you know, why, why kind of reconciliation and platforms like this are important is not just only to, to, to give knowledge but also to receive knowledge because we are human. We learn through asking questions. I find it funny because when we're in school, what do you get told? Don't be shy. Come and sit at the front. You know, ask the dumb questions. Chances are everyone else is, you know, thinking the same question. And yet we don't practice it as adults. We don't ask the questions about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or our culture or anything like that. So I'm here to tell you people, I don't care how dumb it is, I will always answer those dumb, stupid questions that everyone is too ashamed to ask. Because if we don't ask, we don't learn. We're not that scary, like really. You know, if, if you cut me, like, you know, I still bleed red like you do. Actually, I bleed maroon because I'm a Queensland supporter. 
but we won't talk about that after last night's game. Um, we're exactly the same, right? And if you get it wrong, whoops, I'll tell you. A black, another black person will tell you. Correct it the next time. That's how we're going to learn and progress in this country for our kids. So as, as I said, it's also about giving knowledge, right? So yous also need to talk about, about yous. This is what actually makes us more comfortable, is so that we can, we can connect on a more relational level. Because unfortunately, the white man is very, very different, looks very, very different in our minds. And again, that's from our experiences, our elders' experiences, and our ancestors through that amputated limb. So these followers have my email address. If anybody has one of those stupid questions that they're too ashamed to ask, um, absolutely email it to me. If I can help, I absolutely will. If not, then I'll find someone who can get the answers that you need because that's how we're going to progress. And by providing platforms like this, you know, I commend the ANU for doing it. Um, this is how we're going to actually learn. You all, you know, have a little badge of honour now that you can go and take forward that knowledge and learnings that you've had today. You are not going to remember me today for the things that I have said. I've said lots of words. You are not going to remember me for what I said. You are going to remember me for how I made you feel because we're human. Our emotions are what like, put long-term memories into our brains. It's the emotional connection. That's what you need to carry forward to influence the change that we all need, not just black people, but white people as well. It is not your fault that you're a racist. I give you permission to let that go. Leave it on my country and I'll heal it for you. Your first education is the ones that failed you and their first education before that and their education before that. So it's not your fault that you're a racist. The only way that you can actually turn that, and like by racist, it's not direct racism, it's that unconscious bias racist. You need to ask the questions. That's how we're going to change it. So give yourselves permission to let it go. Because guilt, anything driven by guilt, is not actually going to be productive or better outcomes. It's about genuine understanding, learning, and influencing change. So that's pretty much all I had, had to say. I'm short, sharp, and to the point, so still got 45 minutes, but happy to take any questions. Awesome. All right, thank you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Listen, I reckon people are going to remember some things. <laughs> not just the feelings. I'm pretty certain no one in this room, liar or not, is going to see a McDonald's drive through <laughs> the same way. Good. Yeah, I was, yeah, Anne and I were just having that conversation. <laughs> I suspect everyone is going to go home and think about what about the pandemic was triangle shaped. And yep. about what that is between a triangle, a circle, a square, and a hexagon. And there's something extraordinarily powerful in that image too. So that's two things I guarantee you everyone in the room is going to remember. And I can't think that anyone will put down the image of an amputated limb anytime soon as a way of describing everything from song lines and the dream time to the colonial encounter to a persistent known pain I think you have gifted and frankly troubled people with all three of those things and I that's a good thing I think being troubled by things is a way that they burr under your skin and just stay there and don't resolve easily so I think on behalf of everyone in the room can I thank you for those three incredibly precious thoughts but also just for the way you turned up that was extraordinary and I'm so really grateful that I got to be in the room for it yeah oh, pleasure I hope you are all unsettled and uncomfortable because that's my job. 
you nailed it. Yeah. If, if we continue the way that we are and don't get that unsettling feeling, that's where change comes from, right? It's pushing you past your boundaries. How many people have sat in a class and gone, oh, my God, I'm so going to fail this. I don't even know what the hell they're talking about. Um, and you get that yucky feeling, that uncomfortable feeling. That's actually learning. That's progression. So my job is to actually make you feel unsettled and to shift that mindset. Yeah, we used to talk about it in my old job as being productive discomfort. Oh, yeah. That being in that space of being faintly uncomfortable means you have to be thinking, right? And that if you can turn that discomfort into a generative place so that you don't just, as you say, stay guilty, stay irritated, stay angry, but actually say what is it about that that's making me go, oh, and move Mm. with it and through it. And I think you've given everyone in the room that. But you did also make an invitation to questions. Absolutely. And I suspect you're a person who means this. Absolutely. Yeah, I figured you might No, be. I've got to go, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Janessa, we were, yep. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you and I both know this is not a good time sorry, to be going back. Sorry, time, people. It's also not a good time to be going back to Woden. <laughs> no. No. So I reckon we've got you for just a little while longer, no matter which road you went on at this point. <laughs> it would be a bad Canberra experience. So I know Selena promised there were no dumb questions or that if there were, you should ask them anyway. I think that is the kind of generous invitation you don't get terribly often. Anyone in the room whose name I know, be warned. I will call on you. Uh, But in the meantime, I imagine there are others who would have questions for Selena because you get this one opportunity today. So hands up. Don't all just sit there. Questions, comments, stories. I'm open to anything, peoples. Come on. Yeah. I have a vague objection to exegesis as a kind of like I'm now going to give you an entire opinion with a question word at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it'll come on. Um, No. Maybe. Check, check. He's got the gift. Ah, here we go, yeah. I'm still trying to formulate my ideas on this question, but when I grew up, there was absolutely no education in our school system about the Aboriginal uh, beliefs, systems, totems, skin, uh, prohibited areas and all of that, um, which I would have loved to be educated from primary school on that. Um, Are there any limits on what a curriculum can teach as far as secret business and all of that or is it pretty would it be pretty well open to I mean there are there is some things that we we can't talk about uh, absolutely um, but I mean it doesn't mean you can't directly talk about it doesn't mean that you don't I mean the only way to make people aware is to actually talk right so brace yourselves ANU was actually built on a massacre site of of non people, right? It's um it's not something that's been spoken about. Um, but you know, as our elders and old people are passing, um, you know that they were absolutely told that they cannot talk about this stuff. You know, we're in a new generation now where we can talk about this stuff and not be kind of criticised and judged. And so a lot of this stuff is coming out now because it's allowed to be. And those elders who like my nan was 91 when she passed. She passed last year. And up until the day that she died, she was still, even in her dementia state, she would still say to me, like, the carers that would come in, she'd be like, no, no, no. And I'd be like, come on, nan, like, they're here to help you. She was like, no. She said, these people wouldn't let me walk across the street in Yass, and now you want me to let them wash me? Like, so it's still very, very real for them. And so, you know, as, as that, you know, circle of life kind of changes, you know, where we haven't had those horrendous experiences, we can start talking about some of the stuff. Because even as young people, like, I don't talk about some stuff in front of my nan because I know that still hurts her because it's still very real, you know, or even my aunts and uncles. And so a lot of these things we are actually starting to talk about because it is okay. You know, and I had a conversation last night with my 13-year-old boy because um, we, we all watch State of Origin and I was like, I'm so oh, glad that sorry. they're televising. <laughs> um, come on, people. You just go on like you have never won a series. Um, so, <laughs> um, and so I was like, I'm so glad that they televised the Welcome to Country now, right? Because they never used to do that. Um, and... You know, then the national anthem came on and he was like, you know, at school I don't stand for the national anthem. 
like, and I don't see it. I said, good on you, mate. He's like, oh, but I'm scared I'm going to get in trouble. And I said, you won't get in trouble, mate. I said, it's, we're not like we used to be. He's like, yeah, but what if like, like a, a relief teacher comes in and, and doesn't know? And I said, you tell him to ring Selena <laughs> because I said, you will not get in trouble. Like, and he was like, okay. Um, and his brother went through the same school and we went through the same thing with him. But there is this courage now from our kids that they can actually be themselves because even as a kid in primary school, that song, and I had, I was forced to sing it, it just made me so uncomfortable. It made me sick in the stomach because my spirit was so unsettled. I didn't even know it at the time, but I knew something wasn't right. And, you know, now we're at a point where actually we can do that. And so a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, we've come so far, haven't we, you know, with education and, you know, reconciliation and all that kind of stuff. And I go, mm, no, nah, not really. Like social media and internet, you know, yep, that kind of makes it feel like we're more progressive. But that's not the change that I see. The change that I actually really do see is in our kids. Our kids now have the courage to be able to stand up and respond better. Like we have actually, we muzzled them, you know, kind of 100 years ago, 50 years ago. And now they can, they can actually say something. Let me give you an example, right? My now 17 year old, when he was in primary school, in, in um, kindergarten, um, someone called him a nigger, right? He didn't know what it meant, but he knew that it wasn't right. And what did he do? He just went into a shell, crumbled, came home upset, didn't want to go back to school, right? So of course, big mama bear, godmother, walks in there and I was like, you know, this. And the school was really responsive. So it had a great principal. And so we addressed it straight away, right? So I, I coached him through how to deal with that appropriately, right? My nephew, kind of six months ago, end of last year, a very similar scenario, right? So he's fair skin, you know, blonde hair, same school. And he, this relief teacher come in, not from this country, but came in and said, oh, because he's got a birthmark on his hand, like a, a oval-shaped birthmark and she goes oh is that is that where you are aboriginal and yeah and he was like what no i'm aboriginal in my blood it's everywhere and that was the response because we have coached him and and educated given him the right words to respond appropriately where it's not it's not disrespectful you know it's not criticizing it's actually educating so that's the difference that i see you know, equally with our young kids, you know, we're also, I'm seeing adults responding better, but also non-Indigenous people reacting better too. So that's the change that I see. And again, it all comes through education and it all comes through a simple, a simple yarn. Mind you, I did, I just took it under the school and was like, oi, she got five. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but if I had to go, now she got five. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> kidding, not kidding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there are, there are things that we talk about now that we haven't been able to previously talk about um, to educate non-Indigenous people because you are genuinely, like, you are genuinely interested now and want to learn because your first education was incorrect. You want to fix that and get the truth. Speaking of education, um, I'm New Zealand Māori and I was taught in the school that I went to up until year nine Māori culture. It was compulsory. Do you think that there will come a time, especially with the ACT and how it's a little bit more progressive than other states and territories, do you think there will be a time or can you see a time in our lifetimes where that is going to happen here? God willing, that's the goal. Um, that's certainly what I'm working towards and, you know, lots of other community members are. Um, I think our curriculum, curriculum at the moment is just, it's, it's too much. And the reality is an unhappy kid is not a learning kid. Um, and if an Aboriginal child, if their spirit isn't right, they're not learning anyway. 
So the reality is I think it needs to be incorporated. But, yeah, acceptance is hard. Um, and accepting that you were wrong the first time around is even harder. But we've got to stop looking at it as right and wrong, you know, We've got to look at it as progression because knowledge is power, but knowledge is also progress. There was one question down there, yep. Hi, I was, I was just wondering what your thoughts or whatever on were on like teaching non-Aboriginal people Aboriginal culture if they want to kind of adopt some of it or things like that because there's a... A lot of people in our society, white society, me included, who don't really feel like we fit in there either. <laughs> well, look, colonisation didn't, ha didn't happen because we turned the boats away, did it? Like, we are quite embracing of everybody, you know, so we absolutely, you know, will we'll allow anybody in as long as you follow cultural law and you are respectful. Um, and there is a lot... There is a lot of, of that happening. Um, there needs to be more of it, absolutely. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a criticism, so you've got to kind of balance it, you know. And unfortunately, post-referendum, the racism has just roared. It's the worst that it has been, you know, since we were human, since we became humans. Um, I don't know why you know, white people who think they're intelligent think that it's okay to be able to say and think, say what they're actually, like what they're thinking just because we had a referendum. It didn't open the doors for that. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason, good or bad. You know, this was to bring a light to kind of what people were really truly feeling rather than pretending to be. Um, I have been delivering welcomes, welcome to countries now for over 15 years, my nan's been training me. And um, in the past kind of two or three months, so around reconciliation, like lead up to reconciliation and then lead up to NAIDOC, um, you know, after the Australia Day, I've had three people. Um, one guy challenged me in the middle of a welcome um, because I mentioned the referendum. And I've had two other people that like have sung out while I've been delivering a welcome to country. Yeah, like it's, it's beyond rude, it's disrespectful. And, but what, what really hurt me the most was not that he was calling out, it was that nobody around him pulled him up. This is the job of the non-Indigenous people to back us up. If you wanna talk about reconciliation, back us up and help us with the fight. Like, I don't believe reconciliation is dead at all. I think it's at its strongest point. But it takes a lot of courage to do that. And I can't do that because I'm on stage and trying to be professional. Um, but it's the people around us. You know, we learn through people pulling us up. If, if, if one of your colleagues or one of your friends does something wrong, you pull them up on it. You don't be quiet about it. Because if we say nothing, we accept it. And then that behaviour will continue. We've got to start talking up, not just the black people, but the white people, the, any culture, it doesn't matter. Disrespect is disrespect. So that's what we've got to start doing to, to, to kind of correct the behaviour, but also to not erase racism, but settle it back down because our elders have been through this already once you know they're they're we're re-traumatizing them but also what are our kids thinking when they haven't experienced this before and what is that going to mean in 20 30 years time it's a genuine worry well and the ask to be better allies is a entirely reasonable one of this group i'm sure everyone here would say that was a thing they're up for right yeah absolutely you wouldn't be here if you weren't. Exactly. Selena, I've just got a question about the Australian national curriculum. I understand, I may be wrong, but I understand that in year seven and eight now, Aboriginal history is covered at some level. Um, very unlike what I was taught. 
um, which was all Captain Cook. Um, but I have noticed that the last time I looked at the national curriculum that in year 12, ancient history is still only, you know, Rome, Greece, etc. And I think there's the option for students to uh, look at Aboriginal history and given it is the longest living culture, I would have thought that would be one of the primary study areas. And I'm just wondering if you had any insight into why that would be? Is it just changes too slow or resources are not available? Just it's interested in your opinion. I think it's to – I think Australia is trying to please those other countries, right? So we do live in a world, you know, where like the economy and money – everything's driven by money. My, my grandfather used to say the root of all evil is money, right? And if we're not teaching their history here in, in Australia, you know, are they going to pull – you know, their alliance or their money or, like, you don't quite know what happens up on that level, but I would absolutely say it, it influences. And I say that because I've seen people in jobs, um, not just the public service but in all jobs, where they won't say anything or challenge a status quo because their livelihood is could potentially be challenged. You know, we're all expendable. We can all be replaced. And so this is why a lot of people stay quiet, blackfellas included. And, like, it's, it's, it's absolutely not right, but how do we fix it? We've got to rally around them and support them to boost them up. Now, I don't, I don't work for anybody, and I do that deliberately and strategically. So in 2014, um, I decided I was going to quit work. I was working at Google Go at the time. Um, the reason for that was... You know, I had kin care of three, two of my boys, and I was like, why am I fighting and advocating for someone else's kids while mine are being taught at daycare? And, you know, if I fail them, then I've, I've failed. doesn't matter how many other kids I save. So I decided to quit. And, you know, it was the best thing that I ever done, even though it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But the reason I did that was because then I was no longer bound by code of conduct or um, like policies and procedures and stuff. And I don't want to go back to working with anybody because of that reason. So now I see myself as the voice for the people that are working that can't get their voice elevated. You know, because I'll come in and I'll, I'll say the tough stuff, which is the role of an elder, right? You know, they're the ones that come in and back you up. Um, you know, and, and our leaders, that's what they do. And so, you know, there are so many people, again, particularly in the, in the public service, that are being muzzled. Like, my own mob are being muzzled, which just irks me something fierce. And I'm like, tell me, like, I'll go straight to the DG. Because who else is gonna? So I'm, I'm a voice for the, the dead and the failed. I feel like that may make you indispensable. <laughs> just to push on well, you. I'm also, I've only just realised that your water bottle is covered in Mickey Mouse. Told you I was a big kid. Oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I think we have time for one more question. I'm pretty certain that Professor Dr Anne Martin's got a mic in her hand. Yeah, she does. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'd just like to um, say in the first instance... Um, my deepest respects to Annie Agnes because um, each time that we would sit and listen to Aunt give a welcome to country, it it lifted our spirits and it brought joy. And having a 91-year-old mother, uh, the love and inspiration that they have given to us, she was a grandchild, me as a daughter, we have been very blessed. So thank you for being here and uh, I'm sure she'll be incredibly proud of you today. Thank you. Now, in regards to the referendum last year, one of the, the things that deeply impacted on me was some of the, um, the conversations that were coming from our own mob, right? And um, it is... You know, from up on the hill, 
you know, to out in the community, the impact that these these words had, the relationships that they had with um, uh, non-Indigenous people kind of gave um, these people permission to break down a lot of the bridges that we have built over the decades. Now, uh, I was, I only cried once that night and that was when uh, the PM and the minister said, you know, thanks, it's over kind of thing. And I thought I will not cry again because we do lift ourselves up. You can knock us down but we come back. Mm-hmm. But what are your feelings about some of our own that the level of negativity that they place on us, which does affect our children, which does affect our families. How do you feel about that? Because I know as probably one of the older people in the room that it really hurt me that we had not come together, that we had these divides and we can have our differences, but not when it comes down to nastiness because that's not what my mother what your grandmother and what my aunts and that would have stood for yeah absolutely and you know it I was the same I burst into tears and then I actually found some clarity within those tears because I was like you know we we can't just crumble because if we had all then we wouldn't be where we are like if our ancestors and elders just accepted a no and crumbled every time we got rejected or, you know, told we couldn't do something, like we wouldn't be where we are, right? So I found some clarity in that, that, you know, we we just continue. And, you know, I've always said that you've got to lead by example and um, you can only please half the people half the time, right? And my, my nan, you know, she used to always say, don't pay them no mind, you know? Because I was, I, was, I was just in awe of her. Like, you know, things that she would talk about, I'd get so worked up over. And she was like, no, I don't pay them no mind. Like, and that's how she got through. Like, she went through some, some serious racism and, you know, serious torment and torture. And yet she's still, you know, still willing to talk to people, still came out with that kindness, you know, much like your mum probably did. And, you know... I guess I kind of, I, I guess I channeled her a little bit to be like, okay, what's what's the next step forward, you know? And I can remember her like when when things would not go the way that she needed them to, she'd just be like, oh, okay, what's the plan next? Like, you know, it was like, okay, we've got to shift the way that we're doing things, you know, and don't pay them no mind because we get so caught up in correcting the wrongs and proving people wrong that we lose sight of what the actual goal is and you know those, those people that are negative and you know really tried really hard to undo that you know like I don't blame them they were, they were clearly misinformed and didn't understand it but I mean there was so much bullshit out there like you can understand why that was a strategy that was absolutely a strategy and it still is now it absolutely still is. And, you know, I think about that lady's question around the curriculum. Why is Indigenous education, first of all, optional? But if you've got to do it and it's within a unit, why is it always the last thing that we learn? When I mean, it should be the first thing, because we're the first people, and you don't do something else in someone else's land unless you do a welcome, why aren't we learning First Nations people like history and all that first? Like we're still um, passively, aggressively still contributing to that unbiased racism rather than, you know, however many people are here, you know, going, oi, ain't you, or oi, you see. Start moving that unit up to the top because it doesn't matter which order you do them in as long as you do them all, right? Same with the curriculum. It doesn't matter, you know, which way you teach it. 
as long as it gets taught. So these are the things that we, we just accept and unconsciously contribute to that, that stuff. Because, I mean, I studied at UC and one of the, the units that I did was the same story where the Indigenous studies was the last, was number 10 down the bottom. How many people pay attention by the, by the end of the semester on that last unit? Most of them are checked out by then and they're just trying to survive, correct? So is that knowledge actually getting, sinking in? Are we actually learning? And, you know, why is it last? And if you think about like any, like all the curriculums, but even the conversations, we always talk about Black Fire stuff last. And that just is a demonstration of the importance of it. But, you know, there are some things that we just can't pay no mind to, but we absolutely can challenge it. And there's strength in numbers. The other, the other thing too, you know, with that referendum, like I had to do a lot of healing to be able to continue to, to talk about it, you know, which a lot of people still haven't done. We have so many cultural practices that we do to heal, which is how we've survived for so long, that we don't do anymore. You know, we, we can be, we have the the access now to sage incense. Burn that in your office, especially if you're having a tough day. That's cleansing. That cleanses our spirit and what keeps us going and keeps us driving. Go and hug a tree. <laughs> Eucalyptus trees are, are rejuvenating trees. Go and put your hand on a tree. It'll take away all that negative energy. And if, if someone's being mean, that's on them. That's not... As hard as it is, you know, we've got a, it's out of our control. And the more that you try to control it, the actually harder it is and the more it burns your spirit. I don't even know if that answered your question. I was just kind of rambling, but I'm sure it got there somewhere. <laughs> Whatever resonates, resonates. <laughs> I reckon you might be doing yourself a disservice in describing that as a ramble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, just suggesting. Though you have told my staff to set fire to things inside the building and I am going to have a brief moment of anxiety <laughs> about that um, because I've met us. <laughs> I live in vague fear of not sage incense, which I love, but of it in, in a building. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate that as good advice. Can I thank you for being so incredibly generous, so incredibly present in a year where one of our themes is now more than ever, I can't think of a better voice to have been the voice for our reconciliation lecture. We're incredibly lucky to have you on country. We're incredibly privileged to get to have you here. And I think about the place of Canberra, Cambry, in Australia and of the things that this place has held. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I've, my pleasure. No, and we're really... I'm loud, black and proud and I will keep that fire burning, let me tell you. And we need that more now than ever, I reckon. Absolutely. Will you join me in thanking Selena Walker? Pleasure. My um, and I'm going to take and I'm going to take dreadful advantage of you being here. For, have you helped me to do something? You up for that? Depends on what it is. My kids ask me that all the time, and I get frightened. So <laughs> that is a sensible response when it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so as vice chancellor, one of the things I get to do every year is give uh, an award for reconciliation activities, and we have had a whole series of people who were nominated. We had a lot of thinking about it. And there is an extraordinary person in our community, sadly not here today, but he has been an exemplary ally. He has been extraordinary. He is the dean of one of our colleges. And over the arc of the time he has been dean and the years before that when he was a school director, he has been the person that many of my First Nations colleagues turn to when they want an ally. Mm -hmm. He has supported... First Nations projects. He has supported a series of initiatives around the university, including bringing public servants here and giving them access to education, taking the work that his college does to local communities and upskilling them. He has been utterly exemplary. Uh, he's not here, though, because he's on leave, <laughs> which I'm really proud of him for because he doesn't usually take it. Uh, and I've asked Anne to accept the 2024 Vice Chancellor's Reconciliation Award on behalf of Dean Stephen Roberts from the College of Business and Economics. The award is here. Can you and I give it to Anne in this very complicated 
activity? Absolutely. Woohoo! Be my pleasure to. Yay. Thank you. Give that to you. <laughs> hmm? It's, it's a, a hexagon. hexagon. <laughs> oh, good job. <laughs> the question is, what is the shape of the thing inside it? <laughs> Doesn't matter because all shapes fit it's within the hexagon, right? True story, A. Eh? And the other two things we need to remember are? Make us drive through and? Amputated limb. Thank you. Pleasure. You're my, my, my parting words and suggestion is um, whilst I've given you permission to, you know, forgive yourselves, I forgive you for, you know, the unbiased racism that you have been taught. Um, I want you to go away and I want you to do a cultural audit of yourself and also of wherever you work or play or whatever, okay? And actually think about, you know, how can I improve this and what are the questions I need to ask? Because it's only through self-reflection um, and a cultural audit that we are actually going to progress things for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that is my one one suggestion, encouragement. Do it. Well, it's um, it, and demonstrating you've never got very far away from being a teacher because that is the most teacherly thing I have heard <laughs> <laughs> today. <laughs> yes, well. I'm, channel I'm channeling my ancestors through that amputated limb, see? I'm, channel I'm channel channeling my nan because she always used to point the finger, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so thank, thank you. you and thank you for listening, All people. Right. Well done for coming here. This is the first step. <laughs> Pleasure.